Hello and welcome everybody to According to Andrew number 85, Is Democracy Female and Will Africa Become the Next Europe on this hodgepodge Friday? Uh, I have a bunch of other topics I'm going to cover today as well. Uh, I just kind of went through and I was like, oh, this sounds interesting to talk about and this start, sounds interesting. And sometimes uh, they're not enough to have all in one episode. I've done these a couple of times. Uh, so I'm just kind of throwing them all together and seeing what happens. But those are the two main things that I had stuff to talk about. So maybe I'll just end up talking about both those and, and it won't be so much a hodgepodge. Uh, though those are uh, very different uh, topics. So um, is democracy female? So uh, since women operate on a system of consent and conformity, it seems that a voting democratic system is feminine in nature and might give a different color to the revolutionary periods. Uh, because a lot of them were instigated by women. So if you look at uh, Russia, if you look at France, uh, bo uh, both those were instigated by um, crowds of women uh, chasing out. Actually, very interestingly, uh, I just found this out. I was talking to somebody that's from Colombia, I believe, down in uh, down over at Freedom Fest, and uh, there was a bunch of like grandmas that like ran out a cartel or the government or something like that in one of these towns. Um, the uh, The cartels and stuff like that are, are looked at very differently down in Mexico. I'm going to take a major side change in here. Uh, it was Because it was really interesting to talk to him about this. And I, I don't think I talked about this. So uh, I, when I was talking to this guy, uh, he was talking about, like, uh, he's a big fan of... Because we, when we think of the cartels and stuff like that, we think of, um, you know, all the ones that are uh, running drugs and some of the violent stuff that happens between them. But he, he looked at it totally differently. He's like, you know, there's a lot of militias down in um, Mexico. And he's like, that, that's effectively what they are. And then some people kind of retorted, uh, myself included, like, oh, you know, aren't there all these other bad things? He's like, well, yeah, you're going to have, like, thugs and violent people. Like, when people are using force, you're going to have people that are, misuse that force. But um, this is kind of like a medieval breakdown of the political system where it's like, yeah, some of them are going to be bad, but they're not going to have, if they're bad, they're not going to have the support of the people. And then uh, one that is more conformist to what the people actually want can come in and, and take them over, or they can get chased out by a bunch of grandmas with some pots and pans, which was a hilarious story. Um, so that was pretty interesting. So that's kind of how we see it. He saw it as, as all these militias that are basically running Mexico now, and they're just letting uh, the Mexican government be like the face of Mexico, where all of the internal politics is basically taken care of. It's very much a Holy Roman Empire-esque political system nowadays. Uh, and even, uh, if you read, ah, what's his name? The guy that wrote Fourth Generation Warfare. I'm blanking. Anyway, that guy. Um, if you read his stuff, he talks about this a lot too, where, uh, Mexico is basically just the face of, or the, the national Mexican government is basically just the face and the people that actually run the things are these much more local, uh, groups. Uh, it's you have these different national groups and stuff like that. I've, I've heard a couple spots. They don't even speak uh, Spanish anymore. They're, they go, went, there's a couple like native groups that still had their classical language. And then they also is something interesting. They had in the constitution of Mexico, they had more um, rights laid out to them than when you compare them to like native Americans and in, in America, where we just broke all of our contracts and kicked them off the reservations that we promised them and a whole bunch of stuff. So, uh, they had the contract, like, in the Constitution that they could take back that land and run it themselves if they chose to, and a lot of them are starting to take that option, basically, and so we're seeing a, a development of this stuff uh, nowadays, which is kind of interesting. Um, anyway, so, democracy female, uh, so, it always seems to be instigated by them, um, I don't think it's, like, a conscious thing of... And I guess those aren't necessarily tied together, but, um, you know, this idea that we do whatever the majority says is a very kind of group mentality, feminine type thing where as like guys would be like, they'll come up with, you know, there's three guys together and it's like, let's do this, this, and this. And like two guys say, oh, let's do this one. And then one guy says this and they're like, actually, you know, that's a better idea. And then they go do the one. Right. But like, technically you could have been outvoted. And so it's much more tuned to the best possible idea versus uh, what the group wants to do as a whole and not so much. So it's, and that's goes to 
Owens joke about how uh, guys are capitalists and, and females are, are communists, right? If if one girl's having a, a bad time, all the girls are like, oh, let's take care of you and, and get you out of here and, and make sure that everybody is basically having a good time where guys are like, if you're having a bad time, like, don't break down the vibe, like, get out of here, get your get your act together, all that stuff. Uh, it's a very different uh, mentality. And they work well together. Um, anyway, I kind of... Yeah, I, that's basically all I had. Um, and then, obviously... Ah, never mind. So, then the other thing I had to discuss was uh, Africa. So, in the, there's constant warfare basically been happening in Central Africa, particularly the Congo, since the 60s, I think, at least. Um, and there's been a lot of warfare, both internally and externally. A lot of it's been more internal from what I've seen. But I, it's not like I follow uh, the African, what's happening in African politics closely. Um, but it could be something where they're starting to develop like Europe. So uh, in Europe, you had medieval Europe, and then you had a lot of these tiny little polities, and they fought each other all the time, and that really helped kind of create this uh, strong warrior class within the society. And uh, discipline and all these uh, traits that make it so that you had to be on top of your game or you were going to get defeated, and then as these groups did consolidate over time you had top tier uh warriors basically being in great integrated into these uh larger political entities therefore the fighting power just increased exponentially not exponentially but it increased far faster than if that challenge hadn't existed in the first place I was listening to uh, What If Alt Hist recently, and he kind of made a good point where the there was so much competition that, like, uh, was it? I think the, the Dutch were the first one to get to the Indies, and they were pretty mean and awful uh, when it came to ruling that area. And so they came in. Uh, someone else came in. Uh, I don't remember who it was. Maybe the French? I don't think it was the French. Anyway, somebody kicked the Dutch out, and then eventually the English kicked uh, whoever kicked the Dutch out. And... So you have this this evolution, like you couldn't maintain a world empire without being like, and you know they, the British didn't exactly not commit atrocities, but the when you run an empire, like atrocities are kind of just something that happens. Not like I'm excusing that, but at the same time, you had a much more limited amount of that happening. So there's uh, there's that. Or you got the best version of it. It's gonna be bad, but like at least you got a better version of it. So that's that's kind of my thing on that. So anyway, uh, Africa's fighting now. The big thing is the fighting and stuff like that is centered around uh, fourth generation warfare. So that is inherently decentralized, and it relies on skirmishing, light infantry tactics, and hit and run tactics. <laughs> Uh, and it's much more inclined to the fighting style of the Europe, or not the Europeans, the steppe people, and uh, how the people of uh, the Middle East fought. That's one of the reasons that they're actually very effective when fighting uh, people like America and stuff like that. Not only is it against how Americans are used to fighting, and uh, is just a very effective tactic against the style of warfare that America fights, but those people are particularly well suited to that kind of fighting. Uh, when you try to train, uh, Middle Eastern con uh, countries on how to fight third generation warfare with drill and tactics and uh, a lot of these centralized bureaucratic systems that Westerners are used to using. They don't uh, usually do too well. There's a lot of cultural reasons for that. But when you give them uh, this fourth generation warfare style that is much more culturally suited and historically suited to how they fight, they excel at it. Um, so because of this, it's kind of unclear as to whether or not uh, Africa is going to, and this is also is barring if China just doesn't buy them out um, and create other issues, but let's just kind of assume that they're able to kind of stay on an island to a certain extent. Um, they, will that end up developing better political systems overall in the framework? And it's kind of hard to say. So because it is so decentralized and stuff like that, it's hard to say that you're going to have concentrated powers and how you decentralization works to a point but you do need a certain amount of centralization right like uh the whole roman empire is a very fractured very small um 
principalities and stuff like that scattered throughout it, and that was a problem. And you also had uh, city-states and stuff like that. But you get much smaller than a city-state and or a town, and now you're looking at something that really can't... You're basically looking at uh, extended family clan type stuff, and while those are good political entities for like that immediate group and like you're not going to have an advanced society with that you're not going to have a high level of culture and uh, civilization with that style of uh, political structure and stuff like that and if that's how you want to organize your society that's fine i'm not knocking that but you're not going to end up uh, becoming the next europe if that's the route you take however where are we The, if they don't fall to that low of level and they change, how do I describe this? Africa is very tribal, right? But, I mean, so was Europe at one point, so was like a lot of these groups. And these tribes, I don't know how distinct each of these tribes are from each other, if they have some kind of common ancestry that they could uh, consolidate around and potentially form uh, new nation states and become real uh, political powers because there's a lot of young people in Africa which you know it, it's hit and miss right it bodes well for potential economic growth it also bodes potentially problematic for um, political stability depending on kind of the route that they, that happens but if these societies can develop if if common traits can be consolidated against if we can redo some of the borders within uh, Africa so that they make more sense and and put uh, Various tribes that are similar enough can kind of band together and start developing a nation. Then we might see a development of Africa uh, over the next 100 years, or maybe it might take longer than that. I think Europe was, medieval Europe lasted for like 400 years. So, And it didn't really get back to a good spot after the Roman collapse for at least 200. So, you know, it's going to take some time, but they have the potential to really kind of jump to the next stage now there's a lot that can happen in that time period so we'll see but it will be interesting um to see what happens i'm i'm not gonna be around for it but uh maybe maybe you can up in heaven or whatever you can kind of peek in every once in a while and see what's happening see see if any of your predictions came through or maybe you just don't care because you're you're now in heaven you got you got other things to deal with Uh, you're on level two you know um all right, I'm jumping all over the place here. Uh, so I was thinking about this the other day. Are there springboard econ- uh, commodities? Uh, a commodity that it is required by such a large section of the economy that uh, bringing down its price will have an outsized economic benefit as compared to lowering the econo- uh, lowering that of other economic goods, basically an elastic good, right? Um, and I believe this is something that should probably be mapped. These kind of goods are something that are probably should be mapped on your cost of living index uh so like energy is a good one where if you just lower the cost of energy all of a sudden all shipping is cheaper and uh and maybe that's a bad thing because that means that you can do global trade and then that's exporting more of your jobs so maybe that is a net bad thing that's something that maybe needs to be considered um but uh you know it makes food cheaper it makes um things like that uh getting water uh, makes food cheaper, so that may, maybe is a consideration. Uh, housing always is a, a classic one. So just kind of some of these commodities, these goods that, yeah, are have the potential to, uh, what's it called, to have an outsized impact on, on their, on what they can do for the economy overall. Uh, what else do we got? Okay, so a, a random aside. On, so I, this is something I, so people talk about how AI and computers and stuff like that are going to take over. And I don't believe that's the case. And I thought of a interesting kind of delineation that helps illustrate why computers can't replace humans. So uh, rational, rationality is what distinguishes humans from animals. And irrationality is what distinguishes distinguishes humans from computers. And this, I believe, is at the core of why um, humans can't be replaced. Because a lot of times you have to do, like, 
the computer is bound by rationality and it has to do x y and z and it, it'll be this outcome and blah 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 humans can do something so irrational that it has a major outsized impact and causes the world to go in a completely different direction um like i don't maybe this is hard to say but like Like, a lot of experiments and stuff like that start in this kind of fantasy land. It doesn't necessarily start from a rational place. It's like, what if we can... Like, here's a crazy example. What if we can create liquid gravity, right? That's not necessarily a rational thought. It, But it could lead... You can use ra rational deduction and stuff like that to try to maybe figure out that answer. But you would never be able to come up with that idea if you were just a purely logical type being. Uh, and so I think this is something that holds computers back. And sure, there's a lot of things that computers can do that, that humans can do, but, and this AI, but there, you're never going to have that spark in the You're never going to have this, um, basically conflicting ideas that somehow work within this one framework be created by humans. You can't, humans can't create something that is irrational and rational and, and have it work like, uh, like God can, right? We can create a lot of stuff, but we can't create something with that uh, that's unique spark to it. Um, so, uh, and then I, mean, I got a short aside on, on the vaccine thing, uh, and then we'll jump to something that I find quite interesting. Anyway, well, this is kind of interesting, too. Uh, so maybe one of the reasons that they're doing this... Uh, so I was listening to Jim Bob and... Um, some of the other people, and it's, it's interesting because you're listening and they're constantly use you listen to all these different people and because of YouTube censorship and all this other stuff, they can't say particular words. They can't say, uh, vaccine. They have to say V. They can't say, um, I don't even remember what some of the other, but there's a bunch of things that you just aren't allowed to say. And so people have found creative ways to work around this. And it's cool that they can do that and they can outsmart their algorithm. But at the same time, I think it's creating it so, like, when historians go back and try to f dig up this stuff, you end up creating this unique language that's so unique to the time. And maybe it'll be translatable to the people, but it seems like it's such a um, microcosm of the situation that they found themselves in that it'll effectively look to a an outside observer as a foreign code and they won't know what it is. And therefore the only thing that they're going to be able to decipher and make sense of is the mainstream narrative. So when uh, people go back and look at all of the historical stuff and be able to pick out what they can actually understand, it's all going to be your CNNs and your, your MSNBCs, your Fox news uh, all that stuff, because you have people like Jim Bob and stuff like that who are spreading the message and getting important message out in the time period but they get to, they're playing the long game where they get to decide what history knows and what happened during things like 2020 and the subsequent stuff because they get to not have to use coded language. They get to speak freely and that will make it so that when people are going back, uh, historically, they, you know, like 100, 200 years from now, the, the only sources that they're going to be able to make any sense of are these mainstream sources. And while those other sources were useful, so I think this is where, you know, censorship does have a short-term goal, but I think it also has this long-term goal that people aren't necessarily considering. And it'll make it so that this fragmented code makes it so that future generations can't understand what was going on. And that makes it so that if if they can't learn from the the people that were outside the system and kind of yelling, don't do this kind of thing, they can't get that information, then they, then when it happens again in the future, it, it gives them the freedom to kind of pull the wool over the people's eyes and stuff like that in the future again, because these outside voices can't be used as historical lessons in future generations. So I think that's one of the tricks of the censorship, is it's not just a short-term game. Um, all right, and I think the last little thing I'm going to talk about is uh, Machiavelli and Turchin. So I found it very interesting. Uh, I just finished Secular Cycles. I'm starting the next book that he wrote, uh, or another book that he wrote called, uh, I forgot what it is, but it's really good so far. Um, it's his most recent book that he released. Anyway, uh, it's interesting that Machiavelli and uh, 
Turchin have very different perspectives on what the function of fortified cities and towns are. Because Machiavelli is very critical of these fortified or forts and castles and stuff like that. He's very critical of. And I don't know if he's necessarily critical of walled towns, but he, it, generally Machiavelli is very against fortifications because he thinks it's a waste of resources and time and soldiers. So his basic conclusion is with the time and effort that you spent on the construction of the fort, you could have used that to buy better equipment and, and get more soldiers trained up. And then on top of that, you need to put those soldiers in that town. And then when they get besieged by an army, those sol you, you have to go bail those soldiers out with your own army. Those soldiers can't help you in the fight to go bail them out because they're stuck in the town. So now you're just fighting down people for literally no reason. If you had just kept them, if you just hadn't let done that and let them capture the town, retaking the town becomes much easier because there's no walls. You can just walk right in. On top of that, you'd have the extra troops uh, from that we, you would additionally put in the city in your army. So now you have potentially a numerical advantage, which generally means you win the battle like it's not always the case but most of the time it's the case uh it's pretty rare that you have a numerical disadvantage and still win and then uh and then you have potentially better equipment because you didn't spend all this money and time and stuff like that on building forts all very valid criticisms but it's interesting in that it's that if you think about what the function and purpose of these forts and castles are in a different light, then they become, um, it completely changes the, the whole dynamic. Uh, so one of the, uh, things that Church and points out is that those castles and stuff like that, yes, they could defend against armies and a little bit, but generally they'd lose. And especially by the time of Machiavelli's time where gunpowder was very common and stuff like that, uh, you just roll up with a bunch of cannons and blow the crap out of the, the fort. Uh, before that, uh, castles and stuff like that were very effective in being able to keep people out. But the key thing it did is during economic insta or political instability and economic instability, well, mainly political instability, when uh, brigands and uh, bandits and roaming armies are going all over the place, people needed to be uh, be able to get into a fortified location when those people came through because a lot of times you're, you're not coming through with enough people to take the town. You're just coming through to steal a bunch of, uh, to do some foraging or, you know, you're basically pillaging and stealing uh, food and stuff like that so you can feed the army. Well, in that situation, it makes a lot more sense to have a protected town right uh, nearby so that you can get there quickly and not die from these brigands and stuff like that. And these brigands are not ones that are going to try to break into the town. Uh, if you think of the Vikings, one of the ways that the Viking raids were being able to stopped during medieval England is they basically just built a bunch of forts. And the, the Vikings weren't there to siege, they were there to raid. They came in, they stole a bunch of stuff, they bailed, right? So the walls made it so that that tactic didn't re really work anymore. And so they stopped raiding England. Um, and there's other reasons for that, sure. But that was one of the factors. So the, that's what basically these towns do. Is they, they stop these raiders from being able to kill and uh, take their stuff. Yeah, sure, you might lose your field of, of uh, goods and stuff like that, but you're at least not going to die. And so it makes it so that a lot of the, the fields can't be cultivated because the farther you are from the town, when a raider comes in, then you can't get back to the safety of the fortified walls in time, and then you die. So that so it's interesting that they kind of go at it from they come to different conclusions and but they go at it from different perspectives on why they make sense as a investment let's call it uh because you know these these walled fortifications are useful to the and then on top of that um you know when you do have a full size army beside them yeah sure you have all the the other issues but uh, at the very least, especially in a super politically unstable time, having some form of stability is incredibly comforting and and kind of a, a warm, safe blanket that you can kind of drape over yourself. You're like, there is crazy stuff going on all over the place. But right where I am, things are okay. If if stuff does go bad, I have some place I can go to, and I'm not going to die, or my likelihood that I'm going to die is pretty low. So... As bad as it is out there, I can kind of, like, 
I can at least control the little world that I do exist in. And that's kind of the compromise that a lot of people and stuff like that come to. So that that's kind of my uh, my rants, my coverage of various topics that I had. Uh, so, yeah, hopefully you guys found this interesting. And uh, thank you guys for watching. Uh, just a reminder, we're on YouTube, uh, BitChute, and uh, Podbean. Um, so uh, that's where you can get this podcast. Uh, leave a like, leave a comment. Not a lot of people comment, so I'll probably see it. I'll give you a like or maybe I'll comment back depending on what uh, what it is you say if you you got insight or whatever. Um, but anyway, thank you guys for watching and I hope hope you have a good day. Goodbye.